Praise the Lord. This morning, I'd like to share a message called Our Senses Versus Our Faith. Hmm? Our Senses worth, uh, uh, Versus Our Faith. As human beings, God has blessed us with five senses. Do you know that? We have five senses when we're conceived. Hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, and touching. And these senses have a tremendous influence on how we live, how we, how we experience things, how we perceive things, how we react to things, even to people. But God has also given us a measure of faith. We spoke about that a few weeks ago. All we need is a faith the size of a tiny mustard seed and we can move a mountain, right? We also told that we as believers in Christ must live by faith in Romans, the first chapter and the seventh verse. Live by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer. And the Spirit of God that dwells in us. Let's look first at the definition of faith because it has a lot to do with our senses. It's found in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in the first verse. As you find it in your Bibles, would you stand with me as we honor the Word of God? This verse makes absolutely no sense to our senses. You ready? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, <laughs> the evidence of things not seen. The Lord bless the reading of his word and bless his servant as he brings it forth. You may be seated. Let's take another look at this. How can faith be a substance? A substance is something you can see, you can touch, you can feel, right? Of things hoped for. And evidence. I spent my whole life looking for evidence of different things. Evidence. The evidence, which is something you can see and hear and touch and feel, of things not seen. Wow. <laughs> In 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, it tells us as believers, for we walk by faith. Hmm? Especially in New York City. We walk by faith, not by sight. In Jesus Christ. As believers, we can see and experiencing the impossible becoming possible. Amen? You may have some impossibilities right now you're going through. But God says all things are possible to them that believe and are called according to his purpose. We can even fight as Christians. You know that? Got quiet. We are told in 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Hmm? Lay hold on eternal life. Grab and hold on to it as the most precious thing that you have. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. In other words, our testimony should be one of faith. That no matter what's going on, whether it's in the church or outside the church, at work, in the school, wherever, we can believe God and, and speak to God and something can happen to change the situation. Amen? Hallelujah. Again, we are people of faith. Not name it, claim it. That's an abuse of faith. You know, it's not so easy to be filled with faith when fear, we've been talking about fear, and worry, and anxiety, the devil's cousins are attacking us, right? Sometimes we think we're in a well. We can't get out. A slimy pit, we can't get out, right? Remember this. Faith our faith attracts God, <laughs> and fear attracts Satan. He loves that doorway into our hearts and minds. Hmm? You see, in order to overcome fear and worry and anxiety, we have to overcome our five senses, what they're telling us. There's at times when they're not telling us the truth. Hmm? How about when someone says, I love you? Many of us, I'm sure, experienced, I love you, and I love you, walked out the door, right? I'll always be there for you. Goodbye. Hmm? Does what we hear, see, taste, smell, and touch rule your life? Many people are ruled by our senses, and they get in trouble. They simply live by their feelings and their emotions, their senses. 
The Bible describes life for unbelievers in this way, and it's an interesting simile. You ever been in a darkness that's so thick you can't see a hand in front of your face? I've been in that situation a number of times. It's scary. Hmm? You don't know where you're stepping. You don't know where you're walking. You don't know who's near behind you, aside of you. It's scary. And it talks about the unbeliever of the world is walking in this kind of darkness. They can't, their eyes are open, nothing wrong with their eyes, but they can't see because of the darkness that they're in. Hmm? That's why we're the light of the world. Hmm? So how do they live? How do they move? They move by feeling and touching and whatever seems good, they'll go that way. And you know what? We've learned that, most of us, that living like that is a, is a good way to get in trouble, right? People are simply live by their feelings and if it feels good, do it. If it tastes good, eat it. If it sounds good, do it. Even if it leads to destruction and the fires of hell, people are going in that direction. Our five senses can become our enemies if we don't bring them under the control of the Holy Spirit. See, God has given believers a sixth sense. That sixth sense warns us, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. What are you doing this person? You shouldn't be with them. Ever happened to you? Hmm? It warns us of danger and lets us be in peace and be safe. Satan's desire is to take, tear your mind apart and rob your peace. Hmm? He doesn't want you to be peaceful. He wants to tear your emotions apart and give you a nervous breakdown. Most of our physical problems are caused by fear, worry, and anxiety. I told you this before. The doctors from Staten Island Hospital had told us at a, at a seminar that half the adults on Staten Island are on anti-anxiety medication. What does that say? We wonder why our young people are messed up. You see, our, our senses can become our enemies if they alone rule our heart and our mind. Hmm? Thank you, God, that our faith in him becomes our sixth sense. Because sometimes we can see it, but we don't see it. Sometimes we can hear it, but we don't really hear it. And so on. Faith tells us that in spite of what I see and what I hear and what I'm feeling, God will give me the victory in every single case. Mm. That's the kind of God we're talking about. Let's take a look at some of these senses and how even in the Bible, we see how they appear. What do you smell? Hmm? I've had the privilege, and I say that sarcastically, of going into a bar after an incident that happened, and with the lights, all the lights on. It always amazes me how bars have these very little lighting, because if you saw what's really in there, you'd run out. Right? Everything looks good, right? But the smell of a bar is a terrible smell. Uh, I won't ask you to say amen. I'll give you the Miranda one. I've been in drug dens. The stench of people's mess. And people are in there, eh, right? They don't see or smell it or even hear it. There's a story in Daniel, the third chapter, of three young boys that were taken captive because Israel had sinned. When a nation sins as a whole, God removes his hand of protection. We're praying it doesn't happen to America. But we see these three young boys were taken captive because of their, their healthful look, their, their, their intelligence. They were brought to Babylon. They were trained to be teachers and and, and government officials in Babylon. In other words, they wanted to make them Babylonians. And one day, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, who liked them, went to a meeting with some of his advisors, and they said, you know, king, you are a god. <laughs> you are a god. Now, what do you think he said? You're right. <laughs> We're going to build a golden statue to you so that everybody will have to worship it. You think he turned that down? 
What a trap that is. And that's one of the devil's favorite. Make you a famous baseball player. Make you a famous actor. Make you a famous actress. A famous singer. A road that leads to hell without God. One day, the king issued a decree. And when he issued a decree, he couldn't take it back. When a certain musical instrument was played, the trumpet, whatever, everybody had to hit the ground and worship his statue. Mm -mm -mm, he felt good. But these three young men didn't do it. And, of course, they had enemies. And the enemies came and whispered in the king's ear, you know those three guys that you like so much? They're not worshiping your statue. They don't recognize you as a god. What? All, after all I've done for them? Right? Good job, good food, a good place to live. And he calls for them gives them a second chance to recant, right? Hmm. I love what they said. Because the threat is if you don't do this, you're going to die in a fiery furnace, not just a bullet, in a fiery, painful death. I don't know how many have been burnt in fires, but let me tell you, it is not fun, even a little burn. This is what they said to this king. Now you talk about chutzpah. Oh, king? We will not bow down and worship your statue because we have a God who's real. Hmm. But I like what else they said. They said, he will deliver us from the fiery furnace. And then they said, and if he doesn't, we're still not going to do it. I love that. That's real faith, isn't it? Even if I have to die, I'm not going to do it. There are people today around the world that are put in situations just like that. Give up your Christianity, or we'll kill you. The Bible says the king got so angry that they defied him publicly that he had this fiery furnace heated up seven times hotter. They bound them with ropes, and the strong men, the Bible says, strong men carried them and threw them into the fire. And these strong men, because of the heat, and the fact that in a fire, most people die not from the fire. They die from the lack of oxygen. They die. They never got out of the entrance. And here they are, thrown into the fire. Here's the king waiting to hear, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Help me, right? Nothing. Doesn't hear anything. Wonder what's going on. Somehow he's able to look into the fire. Didn't we put three guys in there? There are four people in there. Now here's an idol-worshipping king who is an idol, says, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Now how do you know that? My goodness. And he calls them out. Now imagine walking around in the fire, not on fire, in the fire, on fire. And they come out. The only thing that burned was the cords that held them. And the king notices something about them. Not a hair on their head is singed. Their clothing isn't burnt. Their shoes are not burnt. Their bodies are not burnt. And they don't smell of fire. If you ever been in a fire or near a fire, we had... Our, our Royal Ranger Scouts, we were, years ago, we used to go out, sit around the campfire, and when you came back, it smelled like fire, like smoke. Not even the smell of smoke. Oh, hallelujah. You see, these God-fearing men had to go through this fiery trial. There was no escape for them. Sometimes God allows us to go through a trial instead of avoiding it. I know we don't like that. <laughs> if you don't believe that, the Bible's full of lion's den, Paul's resume about all the things he went through, and yet, as powerful a man of God as he was, he had a thorn in the flesh that, that God said, I'm not going to take it away from you. Maybe keep you humble. Hmm? Either God will deliver you from the experience or the trial, or he will deliver you out of it. It's his call, not ours. 
Sometimes we need to go through a trial. You know why? The Bible says it makes us stronger, not weaker. <laughs> no matter what fiery furnace or trial you may go through, you don't have to smell like what you've experienced. Hmm? Some of us still carry the, the smell of divorce, the stench of defeat, the despair that's been in our life over something that happened. For years later, we carry it. Hmm? Wherever we go, oh yeah, I remember how I failed, right? This negative smell of defeat can make you act like everything else around you stinks. Your personality is affected by it. How you see everything from a marriage to your children, job, wherever you are, there's that smell that you have never gotten rid of. I got good news for you. Jesus can do it. We have our Celebrate Recovery, which deals exactly with that. Why are you carrying a problem when God has forgiven you, God has healed you, and God has made you a new person in Christ Jesus? Hmm? You need to bring it up and throw it out with the help of God. Hallelujah. We have our 12-step program. Same thing. Until a person can say, I need help, nobody can help them. Not even God. Because they refuse help. We have to come to a point and say, you know what? <laughs> I want to be set free. I want the bonds to, to become off. I, I want to be set free in every area of my life. God doesn't want you to walk around with the, with the Stockholm Syndrome, getting so used to being in bondage that you think that's the way life is. It isn't. He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. We're free people. Hallelujah. In every way. Set free to praise and worship the Lord. Let the aroma of praise. Hmm? What's praise? Thanking God for what he's doing. Thanking God what he's going to do. Hallelujah. Worship is thanking God for who he is. This aroma of praise is a sweet smell in your life. And the people around you that you're married to, that your children, they're going to appreciate the fact that the smell is gone. Hmm. And there's a sweet smell to replace it. Hallelujah. Jesus was not afraid to approach the tomb of his friend Lazarus. We know the story. Lazarus was deathly sick. His sisters called for him. He delays. Not because he couldn't do it, but he wanted to prove a point. When he got there four days later, he is brought to the tomb. Everybody's crying and mourning and all these things. They, they, why didn't you come sooner, the sister said. Why did you delay? If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Hmm? He walks up to the tomb. Roll the stone away. What did the sister say? But he stinketh. I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure of finding a dead body. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I <laughs> found a lot of them. And the more they decayed, the worse the smell. Oh, my God. This, this, you'll never forget it. He stinketh. But he stinks. Here's the point. Jesus was not afraid to walk into the stink. Even in your life. And just like he said, Lazarus, come forth. He'll bring that dead thing out and turn it into life. And the stink will be gone. We always think of the fact that Lazarus came back from the dead. You know, there's a process here. In those countries, they don't do all kinds of things to keep the body nice and clean for a while, right? They decay right away. So not only did he have to come alive, he had to have a new body, a healed body, where everything was working once again. 
where the smell of death was gone, hallelujah, and decay. And again, when that man walked out of that tomb, he didn't bring the stink with him. He came out with the aroma of praise and worship. You see, it is never too late for faith to work. Hmm? Never too late. Begin to praise God for what he's going to do. Hmm? Oh, God, would you do this when you do that? I got past that a long time ago. I say, God, thank you for doing it. Doesn't the Bible say with all prayer and thanksgiving? That means when you start the prayer, begin to thank him for the answer. Don't tell him what, how to do it because I found that doesn't work with God. He's going to do it his way in his time and his place. Hallelujah. Begin to praise God for what he's going to do. Hallelujah. And thank him before it even happens. That's faith. Hmm? That's faith. What about your feelings? What do they tell you? Even in the Bible, men of God were fooled by feelings. Hmm? Who is that woman? <laughs> Bring her over here, right? But in Genesis 30, 27, we see a great example. Jacob, one of the early patriarchs, impersonated his brother Esau to steal his brother's birthright and blessing. Hmm. On his mother's side of the family, they were a bunch of scammers. You can read the story. It's amazing. They'd scam you out of your clothes. His mother and her brother Laban, read that story. Work for seven years, I'll give you my daughter. Mm -mm -mm. You see what happens. Anyway, there came this day when the father was ready to give the blessing. Isaac, his father, had become blind. And when, they, when Jacob came in with the help of his mother, his brother Esau was a very hairy man. He was a hunter. They wrapped sheep's skin around his forearms. So his, when his father grabbed him, it felt like Esau, but his voice was that of Jacob. There's a contradiction here, right? <laughs> But here's a man of God, Isaac, one of the patriarchs, decided to trust in what he felt rather than what he heard. Hmm? And he blesses the wrong brother, and it causes a lot of other problems. You can read up on it. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing. And hearing... By the word of God. You want faith? Get into the book. Come out to Bible study. Come to Sunday school. Come to the Bible Institute. The more we know about God, the more we know about his word, the more faith we'll have. And once you see faith in action, watch how it builds. You won't be afraid to pray for anybody, for any reason. How about sight? Do you believe what you see or what God says? In 2 Kings 6, there's a very interesting story about the prophet Elisha. The Syrians had been attacking Israel. Powerful army. But every move they made was counted by the Israeli army. And the king of Syria wanted to know who the spies were. He wanted to kill them. He figured they were in his own camp. And one of his men said, it's not us. There's a man in Israel named Elisha. His God tells him what you say in your bedroom, king. Woo! Now the king, hearing this, sent out a whole bunch of troops to capture this Elisha and bring him there, I guess, for punishment, torture, and death. Well, here's Elisha and his servant. They're, they're going from town to town. We don't know the name of the town. The Bible doesn't tell us. But they're in a, in a city overnight. And apparently it must have a high mountains around them or high hills. And they're in a, kind of like in a valley. Well, in the early morning, the servant of Elisha decides to go out, I guess, get a cup of coffee for his boss. And when he goes out, 
he notices something strange. On the hills above him are all the Syrian army soldiers surrounding the town where he thought they were safe. Ever been in a place like that? Surrounded by the enemy. No escape. He comes back in. I don't know if Elisha was asleep or awake and says, Master, the Syrian army has surrounded us with all their weapons and all their paraphernalia of war. What are we going to do? Hmm? What can you do? Going to fight against the whole army? Hmm? Elisha prayed a strange prayer. <laughs> he says to the servant, fear not. What do you mean, fear not? Look, 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 look. Fear not. What are you, nuts? Fear not. Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they are with them. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Our eyes, our ears, we can see it. What is he talking about? Hmm? Hmm. <laughs> And then he said, Lord, open my servant's eyes to see what I see. Now the man was looking. His eyes were open. See, there are regular eyes and there are spiritual eyes and spiritual ears. That's what we're getting it to. Our senses need a Holy Spirit anointing. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit on Wednesday night. Come on out and learn what the Holy Spirit is all about. The gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and how with the power that God has given us, what we can accomplish for him and for ourselves as well. The servant goes out the door, and I'm sure he didn't walk. He must have walked out like this. He looked up. He saw the Syrian army again. But this time, behind the Syrian army was the army of God outnumbering the Syrians, and it said they had chariots of fire and horses. Wow. Never saw that before. He didn't see it. Chariots of fire. If you read this story, and you can go home and, and read it. It's a powerful story. Elisha comes out <laughs> and says, all of you, in the name of God, are blinded. The whole army went blind. And he leads them, holding each other by the, by the back of this, all the way into where the Israeli king was. And if you read the story, the king of Israel wanted them all killed. The whole army. And Elisha says, no. Feed them. Give them a good meal and send them on their way. You say, that's crazy. Now, let me tell you how crazy that was. All of these men went back to their country and said, don't mess with that country, with that prophet, because of what happened to me. That's a reverse testimony. Their God did all this to us and didn't kill us. He sent back a testimony to every part of Syria, don't mess with Israel. We need that in the White House. Hmm? We don't have to have troops all over the world. We don't have to have bases all over the world. All we need is God. The Bible said it. You can read it in the Word of God. A nation that fears God, God will protect that nation. Hallelujah. You see, if your spiritual sight ends with your eyes, you'll not see the miraculous. You'll never see the impossible becoming possible. Hmm? How can God restore my marriage? He can. If you let him do it. Hmm? He can do it. God wants you to know in your darkest moments that you're not alone. We used to sing an old song. No, no, never alone. You're not alone. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Wherever you go, he goes. You're not alone. And you have the ability to call on the angels of the Lord 
on the Spirit of God to protect you, to watch over you? Oh, my goodness. You know, somewhere in hell, there's got to be a wall. We had them in the precincts. We had the uh, wall with all these pictures of people that are wanted, dead or alive. Well, it doesn't say that anymore. Wanted, right? Do you know your pictures up there, my pictures up there? Because we are dangerous. We're dangerous. God gave us the power to say, in the name of Jesus, get out, devil. Get out. Maybe you need to kick them out of your house, out of your job, out of the school where you're coming and breaking everybody's heart and all these other things. Kick them out. Hallelujah. You're not forsaken. You don't have to be afraid. As I said before, fear is good if it makes you careful. But if it paralyzes you, then it's bad. Hallelujah. Trust God. He'll get you through it. What have you heard? Hmm? With your ears. Unfortunately, in life, even today, more so, I think, because of all the technology, we hear a lot of negative voices. I listen to the news in the morning, and let me tell you something. The day starts out with who got run over by a bus, the weather's terrible, the highways are jammed up, and all kinds of nice stories. Very rarely do you hear anything nice, you know? <laughs> A lot of negative voices, and sometimes even in church. People have negative voices. Mm. Satan wants you to quit. He wants you to give up. He wants you to run away, run to alcohol, run to drugs, run to, run to suicide, run to all these things. Destroy your life, destroy your family, destroy everybody. That's what he wants. And you're going to let him do that? Oh, where are you? Some of you can't make up your mind. He wrote your name down. Hallelujah. He wants you to do all those things. We cannot allow him to rob what God has done for us. God's blessings, God's protection. The angel of the Lord encamped around them that fear and protects them. You got a bodyguard. You will never hear from God's word or from God's mouth that you are a failure. You'll never hear that you're a loser. You'll never hear that from God. We spoke about all the promises that God has given us. God says you're a winner because of me. You are not a failure. You'll be a success. Hallelujah. You'll never hear that God is not faithful. That he doesn't care for you or want you to be his son or daughter. You hear that? Whoever's saying that, but they say they're Christians and not walk away from them because they're not coming from God. How about taste? Hmm. A lot of us have fallen for taste. Go to a restaurant, order half the menu. Hmm? What do you taste? Are you able to taste the fear that you lose your family, your job, even your life? Do you taste the bitterness of failure, unforgiveness, low self-esteem? I'm nobody. Let me tell you something about God. He loves nobodies. And he can take a nobody and make him into a somebody. Amen. You want to give up? It's easy to give up. But it's costly. It may cost you eternal life in heaven. The Word of God has the antidote for all these poisons, these tastes that people have. God gives grace to forgive us. We don't deserve it, but He does. To heal us, to remove the bitterness, to give us hope that a bad taste will turn into sweetness. Hmm? Look at Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Ah, blessed is the man or woman who trusts in him. Now, years ago, 
in our old church, a man walked in one night drunk. He was a terrible husband, a terrible father, a terrible person. At the end of that service, he came down the aisle, gave his heart to Jesus. He wasn't a young man either. His name was Anthony D'Elia. I remember him. From that moment on, that man's life changed totally. I mean, he did an about face, 180 degree turn. He went back to his family, forgave, asked for forgiveness to his wife, to all the wrongs that he had ever done. He had a car. He used to pick up people for church. He'd never say no. Every day he'd come home from work. His wife was a good cook. She'd make a big meal for him. But you know something about people who are married to people that have bad habits? Somehow it sounds crazy, but they, they like that because they have control of the family. And this has happened a number of times in my ministry where a man or a woman comes back to the family and the other, the other husband or wife rejects them because they don't want to give the control back. Hmm? They were in control. Now this man who was terrible, a terrible husband, is being a good husband, a good father, a good man. Some people can't handle goodness. Like I say, every day, she'd make a big meal for him. He'd eat it up. Months went by. And one night after he had finished his meal, she went bananas on him. She started cursing him out. She was screaming and yelling, why don't you die? All these months, she'd been feeding him ground glass and rat poison in his food. That's why you need to pray when you go to eat. He didn't get angry. He just told her Jesus loves you. I don't remember where that woman ever got saved. I never met her. But that man changed. Taste can fool you. Hmm? You see, God desires that we have victory over our senses. Not to, not to take them away. They do help us but to make them spiritual. Hmm? Again, if you rule by your senses, you will live in constant fear and constant worry and constant anxiety and depression, thinking all is lost. And it isn't. It isn't. You see, faith can help you control your senses to the glory of God if you express it and you use it. Hmm? I've told you, every day there's a divine appointment in your life. At least one. Someone says, oh, I'm going through a hard time. Oh, uh, I don't feel good. I'm, I'm, I feel sick. Whatever it is, you are God's person right there on the spot and just say this, would you like me to pray for you? Hmm? As I said earlier, a lady came into the food pantry with a, with a prayer request. And the ladies there at the prayer table prayed for her. And she came back. Jumping up and down. God had performed a miracle. The doctors had written her off, but not God. You have the same power and authority as every other person on the TV that's asking for your money, for the prayer cloth and the prayer oil. You don't need that. Your faith in God can make a person whole. Hallelujah. It's in the Bible, but I've never seen one of these evangelists or one of these people that claim to have all these gifts. I've never seen what Peter had. As he walked through Jerusalem, his shadow, <laughs> his shadow was so powerful, anointed. His shadow was anointed that people would lay their sick people out on the, on the streets, and as he walked by, they were healed. Wow. Hmm. Didn't Jesus say greater things than these will my people do in my name? Greater things than the things Jesus did. And he did some powerful things. What are you facing? You may be facing all kinds of problems this morning. Doesn't seem to be any answer. Doesn't seem to be any clearness to it. 
But let me tell you something. God is there. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are you smelling? The sweet aroma of praise or every negative thing. God is greater than your worst fear or your worst nightmare. Do you know that? Even in your sleep, you can rebuke the devil. I've had people say, oh, I can't sleep. I fall asleep and listen. Listen, before you go to sleep, pray. And in your sleep, command the devil to get out of your sleep, out of your mind. Hallelujah. Again, if you believe solely on what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you smell, or your taste, in the natural world, you're going to miss out on the spiritual reality that faith from God wants to bring you. Faith is the victory. An old song says that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. People may see you as a loser. They may see you as a throwaway. God sees you as a treasure. As a winner. Hallelujah. Let your faith show you what God sees in you and for you. Hmm? Take godly authority over your senses and your emotions. You ever pray that prayer? God, help me to take authority over this. And the worst part of us is not our senses. Where is it? Anybody know? Our mind. That's our worst enemy. Take godly authority over all these things. Walk in faith in God's word, and you'll be a victor in life rather than a victim. Hmm? Faith knows how to win. Hmm? Faith fights fear and wins. Anxiety and wins. Worry and wins. Many times people get prayed for, and they come back, oh, here it is again. When God relieves you of it, leave it there. Don't pick it up again. Let me conclude with this verse. It's found in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Amazing. 2 Corinthians 2.9 and also in Isaiah 64, four, four, uh, verse 4. You ready? I hath not seen, nor ear heard, Neither have entered into the heart of a man or a woman the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God. If you're bored as a Christian, you're not doing it right. But God. Let's stand this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, all of us to realize who you are in our lives. Not just on Sunday or on another night of the week but every day, everywhere, you're with us. Help us to be that light to people that are walking in the darkness, that are seeking what their senses want and are falling into traps of drugs and alcohol and all kinds of negative things. Help us, Lord, to realize that we're the only light they may see. We're the only Christ they may view.